Here at Ling Church, we believe wholeheartedly in responding by faith through giving generously of our gifts, time, and finances. This channel is here through your continued generosity. We would like to thank you for partnering with us in sharing this message with people all over the globe. You can subscribe to our channels on YouTube and iTunes, and we would love for you to share this with everyone in your world. We hope you enjoy this message. 21.9 is time to... I don't know, but like I, I like these little cheesy kind of like things, you know what I mean? Like every year we, something comes along and we like, we coin it and it's like 2019, lean and mean, me and my queen, uh, don't hesitate. <laughs> 21 nine, time to shine. Hey, I believe if you're new to this church, this year is going to be a blessing to your life. And uh, I don't believe that we're the only great church in our area, but I do believe God is at work in our house. And I'm excited for what he wants to do in your life because I believe God has something for you, wants nothing from you. That's the good news of the gospel is that he has come to feed us and to put faith in our hearts, to gear us up to walk into all that he has already destined us for. Amen. And so I'm excited about that. This series has been a blessing to me. And just before we jump into what God has on our hearts for today, I want to give you a word that really God spoke to me on when I was on leave. And every year, Tess and I take the first two weeks of the year like off his leave, and we ask God for a word or thoughts that will guide our process as a church or story as a church for the year. Next week, Vision Sunday, we're going to dive into more of this, Into Faith I Go, and I know it's going to be a blessing of a theme for the year, but the word that God spoke to me on was the word inspired, or to stay inspired, or to be courageously inspired. And uh, obviously we like the idea of being inspired, but I, I want to give some context to what this word means because I believe it's what God wants to do in us this year as a church. The word inspired is from a Greek word, which is theo new ostos. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it. I'm just going to tell you what it means, all right? What it means is there's two big words in this thought. The first is the theos, the second is the new. The theos is like a final authority or like a claim on something. And then the newer is a hard breath. It's not, a, it's not as you would breathe to stay alive. It's the kind of wind-changing breath. It's the, it's the kind of breath that shifts the direction of something. So here's what I want to tell you when it comes to this idea of God inspiring us. Because we are inspired by His Word, all right? What happens when we are inspired is that there is a breath of God that comes in us that shifts the direction. It has the ability to shift the direction and claim new ground in our lives, all right? So to be inspired is not to be fired up. To be inspired is to be moved towards what God has for you. Now, here's what I want to say to you. When God's Word is preached, I believe inspiration comes. It comes every week. It comes as you listen to worship in your car. It comes as you sing. It comes as we preach. But I believe that today, as God's word is preached again, to those who would hear it, I believe that God is going to inspire you, not just get you excited, but he's going to shift the direction of your life, move you toward new ground in your life where he stakes a final claim on it. I love the idea of being inspired. That means tomorrow doesn't look like today. That means God is doing something new in me all the time. Stay inspired. Tap your neighbor and say, you inspire me. Helping your husbands and wives. Getting your marriage off to a strong start. So we've been in this series called Selfless. And really the big idea is this. At the start of every new year, uh, we come up with a whole lot of New Year's resolutions or, or goals or ideas and dreams. And these are good things. I've done them, you've done them, and I think we should all do them, to be honest. Uh, but typically, those ideas bias toward me, a new year, a new me. That's the bias of our hearts. This series has taken another look at it and said, what if the greatness of 21.9 was not a new year, new me? It was a new year, less me. What if the greatness of this year was not defined by what I did to improve myself? It was defined by how I leveraged myself to improve others. And so that's been the big idea of the series. And I've really enjoyed listening to it, even from a distance. Our online feed is world class. If you're ever not in church, guys, just jump online. Facebook, every week there's live church. You'll enjoy it from anywhere in the world. Amen? And so I've enjoyed watching it. And just as we have a quick summary, first week Slevy looked at faithful in service, and uh, it was really awesome because in kids' church, because they're following a similar routine, they got given these uh, like forms where they had ideas as to how they could go and serve the world around them, leverage their lives to serve people outside of them. 
Now, you would think that that form would be left behind, but what the teachers told them geniusly, and Bridge hayden really is doing a fantastic job there, is she, she, she told them, if you come back with a full form, I'll give you a treat. Like, I mean, I think that's just good, good ethics, you know? And so, and so anyway, I got home, and, and I wasn't aware of this thing, but my kids got hold of the documents because we were away, and they were like, Dad, can I make your bed for you? Now, I don't know what was going on. I'm just thinking, this is a good day in Africa. So I'm like, yeah, sure, baby. No problem. They made my bed. They came. They offered me the form. They said, why don't you just tick it over here? So I'm like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> don't worry, Dad. Can I make you tea? And so I figured, well, I might as well just, if you, you know, join them. And so here we go. I'll take that form all day if I keep getting blessed like this. Long story short, my kids that week, they carried their bags to school. They offered others to carry their bags. They made their beds every single day of the week. They made me tea most days of the week. They cleaned up. They spoke kindly. I'm thinking selfless is awesome. Thank you, Jesus, for our kids' church. If you have, like, friends who have kids, you ought to bring them to Link Church, Kids Church, because even if the parents don't like it, the kids are going to come alive. And so week one was looking at faithful in service. Week two was looking at being grateful in the grind. Last week, grateful in the grind. And I love this, this quote Slevy made. I thought it was so brilliant. He said, the prize is not what you accomplish occasionally. It's what you do daily to the glory of God. The prize is not what you accomplish occasionally, those big peaks in the year. It's what you do daily to the glory of God. It's finding a gratitude in the grind. It's finding gratefulness in the work we do, in the families we lead, in the lives we have, in the friendships we have. It's not just the peak moments. It's all of life. And so selfless has been a real challenge for us kind of to get outside of ourselves and to enjoy people around us. Today I want to speak about being bold in witness being bold in witness. And really the tagline I have for you if you're writing down notes is this, you have a story worth telling. You have a story worth telling. Notice how I didn't say you're a preacher, you have a gospel message worth preaching, you have a perfect packaged you know, understanding of the Bible back to front. No, 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 just you, your name, you, and you, you have a story worth telling. And I wanna show you how there's a connection between the story you tell and somebody else's salvation in their life. Your story. Jesus is involved, but it's your story. And, and so I want to make a connection um, by way of setting it up. I'll tell you a little quick story. My daughter, Mackenzie, is very clever with words. You may know her. And uh, so what we were doing in our car last year, I was having some fun. I was busy studying kind of Hebrew as a, as, as a pastor, as you do. And, uh, and so I was testing it on my children, as you do. And uh, as we were driving to school the one day, I said, hey, girls, do you want to learn what the name of God means in Hebrew? And they're like, nah, not really. I'm like, just let me do it. Just come on, give me five minutes, turn the music off, and, uh, and, and we can do this thing. So I explained to them what the name of God means in Hebrew, and they kind of going, wow, it actually means that? Those four letters have that kind of significance? I'm like, yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? They're like, yeah, it is pretty cool. A week later, Mackenzie comes back to me, and she says, hey, Dad, remember that story of God's name in Hebrew? I'm like, Yeah. Because now, now I'm like, it worked, right? And, uh, and she says, I taught it to my teacher. I'm like, you did what? <laughs> she said, I'm serious. One day I'm sitting in my class and I said to my teacher, ma'am, uh, do you understand Hebrew? <laughs> Grade four. Teacher says, yes, I do. She's like, okay, cool. Like, true story, yeah? Teacher studying Hebrew, what are the chances? <laughs> so... So she's like, yes, I did. Kenzie's like, okay, cool. Do you know what the name of God means in Hebrew? She's like, to be honest, no, I don't. I've never, I've never looked that far. She, far. she said, well, it's Yod Vahe. It's the open hand of grace nailed to the cross in grace. Did you know the teacher's like, what? Kenzie comes home. She's like, Dad, I taught the teacher Hebrew, and I taught her what God's name means in Hebrew, and it's all about Jesus. The teacher's like, wow, I learned something new today. And I'm thinking, like, I would never even said hello, let alone taught them some Hebrew. You know what I mean? Like, hey, teacher, can I teach you about Jesus in Hebrew today? You know, it's just, it's just not what I'm thinking about when I rock up at my mate's house to watch the football. It's not what I'm thinking about when I climb in my car to go and spend a day with my work colleagues. How am I going to teach them about Jesus in Hebrew? I'm barely, I'm barely courageous enough to tell them that I go to church. You know what I'm saying? Why is it that we enjoy what we have here so much but battle to translate it? 
What is it about the faith of a child that walks into an ordinary classroom and just transforms the space by witness? And what would it look like for you and I to have that kind of faith that walks into the seasons of life that we're in? The moms that we hang out with as we raise small children's children. Children's. Sometimes it feels like there's so many of them there are children's. Everywhere. But if it's the business you're in, or if it's the school car park, or if it's your sports team, or if it's your crew of people you hang out with on the beach, what would it look like for us to leverage ourselves this year in a selfless way and share testimony of what God is doing in our lives? What would it look like this year, here's the question, to be bold in witness? I want to read a scripture from Acts chapter 4 and give you some pointers because I believe you all have a story worth telling. And some of you, it's closer than you think it is. And if you would activate that today, we could change the world together. Amen? Acts 4, verse 4. Uh, it starts like this. The priests, what's going down here basically is uh, Jesus is no longer around with his disciples. They have now received the gift of his presence, and they're going about doing what he called them to do without him present in the room, but he's present in their hearts. That's where you and I fit in the story, and so there's a connection for us today. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's pretty bold. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. There is going to be opposition, but we are going to be presented with great opportunity. Just because three people in your world don't like what you have to say, it doesn't mean that another 5,000 can't be changed. I want us to start looking for the opportunity God has put before us. And they seized them and they put them in jail. Verse 4, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men that day who believed grew to about 5,000. That's big numbers. The next day, rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem, and as the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. And they had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them, by what power or what name do you do this? In other words, what we're seeing is not natural. Can you explain it? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness... You see, it's kind to share your testimony with somebody. I know it's scary, but it's also kind. It's a blessing to them for you to tell them your story in Jesus. For an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and being asked how he was healed, then know this, people, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no other name and a heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Verse 13, when they saw the courage, say courage. I'm going to pray courage into your hearts today. Is that all right? When they saw the courage of Peter and John, I don't think what we lack is clever. What we lack is courage. I remember being in a room full of leaders one day, and I was introduced as a young pastor from Belito with a very cool church. And as much as that sounded kind of good to hear, I didn't feel it was an accurate representation of who we were. And so as I got up into the room to speak to these leaders, I said, thank you so much for introducing me as cool. I believe my children will be proud. But the truth is the way I'm trying to build the church is not cool. It's just clear. So what you call cool is just me trying to be clear. It's trying to take a message that people have misunderstood for years and put it in an easy way for them to understand. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be cool. I'm just trying to take the depth of the scripture that is life transforming and help ordinary people like myself understand it. Just want to be clear. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. And they were astonished and took note that these men must have been with Jesus. By the way, the overflow of worship is always witness. Where there is worship, there is witness. Where there is no witness, let's keep going. Verse 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. And so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign. We cannot deny it. 
But to stop this thing from spreading, spreading, I believe God wants to spread the good news this year. And I believe he wants to spread it from more than me. I believe that as we become selfless, he's going to spread it through you. He wants to, they want to stop this thing from spreading among the people. So we must warn them to speak no longer, to lose their courage to witness to anyone in this name. Verse 18, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to listen to him? It's a rhetorical question. You be the judges. But as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. You have a story to tell. After further threats, they let them go and they could not decide how to punish them because people were praising God for what happened. The man was miraculously healed over 40 years. I want to speak about being bold and witness. And what I want to do from this story is give you three simple ideas or three thoughts toward what it means for you and I to be bold in our witness. Because here's what I know. When we are bold, the whole world gets transformed. Not when, not when we're clever, not when we have it all worked out, not when we make lots of money, not when we come to church five times in a three-week month, but when we are bold in our witness, lives are transformed. I wonder what the 5,000 looks like today. I wonder what the 5,000 looks like in your business realm. Could they be astonished at the courage of how you build your business for Jesus? Could they be astonished at the courage of how you teach to the glory of God? Could they be astonished at the courage of how you raise your family with a value system that revolves around the name of Jesus? Could they be astonished enough to go, we want that? Three things I believe will help you be bold in your witness this year. The first is simply this, and you've got to write this down. It's going to take a bold stretch. For the good news to spread, Stephen Furtick once said, his people must stretch. In fact, I want to read something from Isaiah 54, verse 2. It says it like this. Isaiah 54 is a prophetic picture of a preferred future. All right? And it says this. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Do not hold back. Lengthen or stretch your cords. Strengthen your stakes. And then it says, for you will spread out. In order for God's good news to spread or societies to be changed or business climates to be transformed or South Africa to be transformed, in order for God to spread, his people must learn to stretch. In other words, we don't see spread without the stretch. It's just something God is telling us. And so I want to put a courage in you as you start out this year to ask this simple question. God, what does it look like for me to stretch in my family, in my business, in my marriage, in my life, in this church, in my role in society? What does it look like for me to stretch? Because in order for you to spread this year through me, selfless, I'm going to have to realize it's going to take a stretch. It says this in verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, when they saw the courage, the boldness, they were astonished and thought they must have been with Jesus. I believe this year, Link, as we look to start a church in Amschlange, uh, kind of core to why we want to do it is realizing if we want to reach new people, we're going to have to start new churches. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not an over a, a kind of thought out process. We want to see Durban transformed by the love of God and we want to see culture shaped around the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to plant churches that represent the goodness of God. Amen. And so we're going to plant and we're going to launch. You'll hear more about that this, this next Sunday coming up. For businesses to be launched that will serve kingdom expansion, vision is going to have to be inspiring. You're going to have to get out of your kind of just mundanity of arriving and just being there and work into yourself an inspiration that calls your employees forward. It's not going to be, it's going to take a stretch. For students to come alive under the sound of our teaching voices, we're going to have to bring them something that is beyond what they see every other day. We're going to have to stretch. For our kids to realize that what we represent as mom and dad is more powerful than what anyone else in the world can say, we're going to have to be present and we're going to have to be intentional and we're going to have to stretch ourselves, get out of our agendas to be present in their lives. It's going to take a stretch. For leaders to be empowered, value needs to be created in a way that challenges them to serve something greater. 
for friends and colleagues to encounter Jesus, we need to live in a way that reveals Jesus. It's going to take a stretch. I was watching a little thought on this just the other day. And the comment was, we don't need t-shirts. We just need salt. Because it's not about the bumper sticker or the t-shirt that claims what you hope to be or the billboard in your business that states what you're looking for is who you are. We don't need t-shirts, just salt. Tap your neighbor and say, no t-shirt, just salt. This preacher went on to say, in fact, leave the t-shirt at home. Get out there and be salty. He said, make him thirst. I thought that was good. How about the way we live our lives this year, the way we stretch ourselves to represent something of God in the society we live in? How about that is so salty that people start to thirst? How about the company of people that we keep starts to become so excited about what we carry because of our salt? It's going to take a stretch. We can't do things the same way and expect a different result. I don't know what world you're in. If you're in entertainment, if you're in sport, if you're in business, if you're in politics, but I'm telling you, it's going to take a stretch of your walk with God to start seeing people transformed by the work you do. Every year I laugh because I go back to Discovery Health to get my points for the year. And you know me, man. I'm, I'm built like a bush pig, right? I'm proud of it. I'm short and I'm fast, but I got tight hammies. And so every time... Every time I go for my stretch campaign, and now it's become the same guy year after year, he sees me coming in, he says, should I just give you the same points as last year? I'm like, yo, sorry, man. I'm definitely going to get zero on that one again. I just, I can't touch my toes. Barely make it past my knees. Not going to show you now. <laughs> and one day he says to me, buddy, you're going to have to start stretching. I said, I don't care about the points. He said, neither do I. I care about you. Fair Fair game. And so I am trying, in fairness. But the truth is, what he's saying is powerful. I don't care about the points. I care about you. I don't care about what people see in your lives. I care about the fruit it produces in your life when you stretch. It's not about, hey, did you see what I, did you notice? Did you, how much money I gave? How present I was? What I said the other day? What I wore on my tee? Did you see the statements I put on my bumper? Are you aware? It's not about what you're doing. It's about what it's doing in you. A bold stretch is going to be the starting point to bold witness. Second thing I want to share is an honest story. An honest story. Can I say it like this? People are looking for real, not right. People are looking for real, not right. Sometimes the greatest challenge to us sharing our faith with someone else is thinking that we need to tell them something about Jesus that we haven't already discovered for ourselves. Do you know, we live in a world, I want to help you with this quickly, that is conclusive in nature. Well, it wants conclusions. God was teaching me about this last year. Our Heavenly Father is in a conversation with us. But when we go into any conversations, we want conclusions. So we sit down with someone and we want an outcome. Or we have a conversation with our children and we want them to do what we say. It's conclusive. That's the, the approach we have to anything that is talk is we need conclusiveness here. Or we need a conclusion here. But the kingdom of God is not conclusive. It's a conversation between God and his people. Why? Because conversations that remain open draw us into an outcome that we wouldn't have found if we checked out on the first time because we didn't get what they needed. Can I help you with this? When you speak to your friends about your life with God, just tell them what you're experiencing with God. Don't worry about what Dill experienced or what Dill said or what somebody else experienced or the scripture that came up on your U version that day to impress them that you're reading the Bible. Just tell them what he's doing in your heart. Hey, I never used to have courage. I'm starting to get more courage. Hey, my children never even used to know what prayer was. Now we're starting to pray every night. And that's what God is doing in my life. Can I tell you, when Peter and John were testifying, what seems like an academic argument was just this them telling the story. In their world, everything was academic. They were, they were part of that society, so they, just, they, they logically broke down what was going on, but they were just telling the story. Hey, there was this guy named Jesus, and then you put him on the cross. Remember that, guys? Uh-huh. And then he didn't stay in the grave, and he rose again. That guy named Jesus, we used that name, and this guy got healed. Anything else you want to know? I think when the church starts to realize it's not about being right, having the perfect, perfect Bible language and like, you know, all fit out life. No, just be honest. I'm, I'm kind of struggling with some stuff, but God is at work in me. 
My marriage isn't perfect. You know, it's like there's nothing like that marriage that walks into church like. <laughs> and that, I'm giving the husband's impression. Wife is like. <laughs> I don't really want to be with you right now. And we're like, it's fantastic. Honestly, it's fantastic. Everything is awesome. Never been better. Intimate life is the best it's ever been. We're kind of sleeping in rooms opposite sides of the house. But you don't even know that part of the story. Why don't you tell your friend that? I dare you. We're not going through everything that you would dream of in a marriage right now, but we're present in the house of God, and he's knitting our hearts in a new way, and we're believing for an outcome that's different. I reckon more people come to church if we just got real. You're going to have to stretch, but you're going to have to be honest. Newsflash, I'm not a perfect pastor. Please don't tell the guys outside these walls at the moment, everyone in this place thinks I'm perfect. It's awesome. They think our family's got it all worked out. Could you just, actually, could you go and tell them that I told you this? Could you go and let them know that our pastor's so real that he wants you to come and be a part of our church, even though you're going through some serious stuff because he's going through similar stuff. He's just on a journey and he's in a conversation with God. Here, here's the foregone conclusion God is good, but here's the conversation I'm trying to figure out in my pain. Here's the foregone conclusion God is generous, but I'm trying to figure it out. My bank account's empty. So let's not force on a world something that God is when they're stuck in a conversation of trying to understand what he's doing. Let's invite them in. Come to church. It's just a conversation. Come hear the word of God presented in a practical and powerful and personal way. Just let the conversation stir. You don't have to have it all worked out. Let's be bold in witness this year. Let's invite our friends to church this year. It's amazing. In Acts 4, it says, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. I felt God say to me a while ago, when the world discusses what you have to say, just keep telling them what you've already seen. People are going to have a lot to say with what your life looks like. Just keep telling them what's real. Because they can't argue with a testimony. In fact, Revelation says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the name of Jesus, and the word of their testimony. That's what's happening in Acts 4. They're mentioning the name of Jesus, but they're also telling an honest story about their lives. Let's just tell people what we're going through. And watch how God uses your brokenness to bless somebody else's life. The third thing I want to speak about is a simple prayer. A simple prayer. Bold stretch. You're going to have to go where you've never been to reach people you've never reached. You're going to have to do business in new ways. Maybe it means being generous toward employees in a way that you haven't before. Maybe it means starting investment programs that serve their lives rather than just draw from their lives. I don't know what it means to stretch, but you're going to have to model something that is supernatural if you want them to pay attention to what's going on inside of you. But when that's happening and they start to ask the questions, don't tell the story you think they need to hear. Tell them the story that's actually going on. Because you have a story worth telling. I didn't think I did when I had just given my life to Jesus. I remember coming home that night from church. My friends were out. They went to a party. And uh, one of my friends phoned me late that night. He wasn't in a good way. There were drugs involved. They said, I need your help. I'd just given my life to Jesus. It was all a surreal moment. I remember driving home, sitting him with him on the sofa, calming him down, taking him through to the morning so that he could get some clarity of mind again. And I remember him looking across at me and saying, so tell me about this church deal. And I was like, I'll come back. it's awesome. And I thought, like, God, if I just told him that day how good you were, uh, it wasn't all worked out. You see, he thought I'd, I'd changed my behavior, but I hadn't. I just changed my belief. I was still figuring out my behavior. If I just told him that day, God started something in my heart that I believe is going to bless the future of my life, maybe he would have listened. So let's get honest. And the third thing, as I said, is let's pray a simple prayer. Listen to what they pray. In Acts 4, it says, verse 29, what happens? So, so here's the context. They're preaching, they're excited. By the way, these guys were scared to death on the Sunday night. Now they're preaching to the streets and thousands are getting saved. Feels like you and I, God, I don't know if I could do this Monday. All right, I'm in. That's what it's going to take. I'm going to get up and go. We're going to do something for Jesus this year. And they do it and people are getting saved. And then they get accusations and opposition. They're like, why are we doing this? And so they go back into the room in verse 29 and listen to what they pray. 
Now, Lord, consider the threats, consider their threats, and enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. Now, Lord, consider the kickback of employees, consider the gossip of society, consider the, uh, the, what, what the papers are saying, con con consider the kickback, consider the threats and enable us, church, I don't know if there's 400, 500 people in the room right now, enable them, God, to speak boldly, with great boldness. And then it says this, verse 30, and I love this, because God always, as Slevy said, turns it around to become the source of what he actually wants as an outcome. They say, God, stretch out your hand. So yes, bold witness is going to take us stretching out ours, but it starts with realizing that he stretched out his. I mean, this is the story of the gospel. Jesus literally stretched himself out so that we could receive what we never deserved to walk into a world and make change. And they say, stretch out your hand, God, to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, listen to this, the place that they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. It's going to take a bold stretch. It's going to take an honest story and it's going to take a simple prayer. God, give us boldness. So stand with me this morning. I want to pray a simple prayer.